This is a story that my primary school teacher, Mrs. Harper, told me when I was about nine years old. And she, she was a brilliant storyteller and she said that she made this story up herself when she was about nine years old after reading a poem called The Listeners by Walter de la Mer. And uh, she made up the, the story to lead up to what happens in the poem, with the poem being the ending of the, ending of the story. And uh, she said as she got older, she never saw any reason why the story didn't work for that poem. And so she told us the story, and I really liked it, and I memorised the poem. And I'm going to tell you the story now. So, it's set in the times of the um, of the Great Plague, when uh, when the, the plague was sweeping across Europe and, and Britain to a lesser extent. And uh, it was a, a family who were very wealthy. They, they, they had this huge stately home type house in the country and um but but they weren't they weren't like nasty wealthy people they they were very very good people they cared about their land they didn't just pull up all their hedgerows and all that sort of thing they they cared about traditional farming methods and they were really kind to their work their staff uh they all had really quite nice lives for servants in those days and uh they cared about causes in the local village and things like that and everyone in the village and around them and their staff all loved them because they were such nice people unlike their wicked cousins their evil cousins who lived in the next village who were really money grabbing and and they they were next in line for, to inherit all their house the house and all their wealth and they really hoped that the plague would hit this nice family so they'd all die off and they'd get all their money and they really resented this family for for all the charitable causes that they put their money to and they they kind of thought of it as their money and they really hoped they would die and they would think why are they spending all this money that could be ours one day and they they knew that if they ever inherited the property and the money they would keep it all to themselves and they would reduce their staff when they'd dig up all the all the countryside to to make more money out of the farm and and never give any money to charity and basically just become as wealthy as they possibly could but fortunately they didn't they didn't own the house and they hadn't inherited the money now the eldest son of the family was also a very nice guy he really wanted to travel travel around europe which in those days you couldn't just phone up the travel agency and say yeah get me a get me a ticket it was it was quite a big deal um and it was quite dangerous and what with the plague in europe and everything the the family weren't at all keen that he should go but he argued it like this. He said, well, the plague could hit me in Europe, yes, but it could hit you in, in England here. And in a way, me going to Europe means our eggs aren't in one basket because if the plague hits us here, we'll all die off and, and our horrible cousins will inherit all the money. Whereas if I'm in Europe and I get hit, maybe you won't be in, you know, hopefully it won't happen the other way around, but at least it's not, at least it's, we're not all together. And the family thought, well, okay. And they knew that he really wanted to do this travelling in Europe. And uh, so they agreed to it. And their cousins, of course, were delighted because they thought, great, he'll get hit by the plague. That's one down. A few more to go. So, but there's there's a clause in the um, in the inheritance because the way the inheritance worked in those days is they, they had to make sure that there was someone to inherit. So the, 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 there was a clause in the in the inheritance that said that if he wasn't back, by his 21st birthday and the rest of the family weren't alive then it would automatically go to these cousins um, so they said to him whatever happens you've got to be back by your 21st birthday just in case something does happen to us and he promised them that he would definitely be back by his 21st birthday so he goes off and he, and he has a fantastic time in Europe but unfortunately while he's in Europe the plague does hit the family, the nice family, and and tragically they are all killed, and the house is shut up and blank, oh, sheets are put over everything and it's all it's all closed off, and the cousins of course are delighted. Uh, they 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 can't wait. They hope the the son gets killed in Europe as well, and they 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 think this is it. They're going to inherit, uh, and they're really they're really optimistic, and they uh, they ask the the solicitors if they can have a look around the house and um and what they don't know is this is this is a ghost story by the way it's not a it's not a scary ghost story but it's it's a ghost story and 
what happens is that when the family die they don't go straight to heaven which of course they're, they're destined to go to they um they become this kind of suspended animation type they, they they're not exactly ghosts they're, they're like ghosts in the sense but they don't have like bodies and they don't walk around with the white or anything like that they uh they just listen all they can do is hear and and they listen to what's going on in the house and um when the cousins come round to, to see the house and they start discussing all the things they say oh well we can rip out these old fireplaces get some money for that and they're discussing all the terrible things they're going to do when they inherit and the family the dead family can hear all this happening because they don't want to they don't want to go to heaven until they've heard the sun come back they can't rest in peace until they've heard that the sun comes back has come back and stopped the cousins inheriting this place and and they're really tormented by these voices from the cousins and even after the cousins go they hear these sounds echoing round and round the house and 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 it's terribly painful and tormenting for them and and they can't get any rest at all and they know that they they'll never be able to rest properly and have any peace until the sun meets his promise fulfills his promise and comes back before his 21st birthday and anyway meanwhile the son's having a fantastic time he's rich he's young he's good looking he's 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 ha he's got everything he could possibly want wine women and song and he's and he's out in the sun and it's it's wonderful and he's kind of thinking well they'll be all right i don't really need to get back by my 21st birthday they'll be fine and and this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and he kind of leaves it a little bit too late and he really should have left by this stage if he's going to get get back to the to, to to home back to his home before his 21st birthday but of course he doesn't know that his family have died because letters in those days were more or less non-existent and um but eventually he starts to feel a little bit guilty he thinks well i did promise them but he's left it a bit late so what he, but he, he finds the the quickest way you can travel in those days is what you do is you, you get a horse you hire a horse and you, and you gallop the thing flat out to the next staging post and then you swap horses <coughs> and then you get another horse and you gallop that flat out to the next staging post after that and so he decided okay i'm going to try and get home by my i'm going to try and meet fulfill my promise and get home by before my 21st birthday because he hasn't got there yet and so he does this he gallops his horses and he gallops all the way through europe and he gets the first boat across and he, and he's, he's this is exhausting he's he's young and he's fit but this but this is just basically galloping flat out through through europe and he's getting tired and tired but he's fit and he and he gallops more horses all the way through england and he gets and he gets to his region and he comes up to the uh to the staging post near near to his house and and he so he's and he does it before his 21st birthday so he saved his inheritance and people around the area see him and they know he's still alive and so he successfully stopped the cousins from inheriting but he starts to get this very awkward feeling because people are kind of avoiding his gaze and he's saying well how are my family and they're kind of saying well so it's not for me to comment on that sure I, I don't know sir and they're kind of being really kind to him and really friendly but at the same time they're they're, they're obviously very very awkward in his presence and he starts to get this this painful feeling in his stomach thinking something has happened to my family or they wouldn't be acting like this and, and he thinks of how much he loves his family and he thinks of all the great times he's had through his life with them and so even though he's saved the inheritance and even though he's exhausted he gets another horse and he gallops that flat out to his home and he go, gets off his horse and goes up to the front door and that's where the poem starts which ends the story it's called the listeners by walter de la mer is anybody there said the traveller knocking on the moonlit door and his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor and a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveller's head and he smote on the door a second time is anybody there he said but no one descended to the list to the traveller no head from the leaf fringed sill leaned over and looked down into his grey eyes where he stood perplexed and still but only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then 
stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men, stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall, hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call, and he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky, for he suddenly smote on the door a third time even louder, and lifted his head. "'Tell them I came, and no one answered, that I kept my word,' he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, but every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. Aye, they heard his foot upon the stirrup, and the sound of iron on stone, and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hoofs were gone.